Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you here in worship this morning. Jamie, thank you all for, uh, thanks for playing. Um, uh, just a couple of announcements that I want to make this morning. I hope you got this morning when you came in this little brochure uh, about the wood carving that's behind me. Um, I discovered, I don't know why I didn't realize this after these months of being here, uh, that the wood carving was one that relayed the uh, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount. Nor did I realize, uh, until Doug showed me, uh, he had a thing on his phone, um, that there were specific designations of areas that describe each of the Beatitudes in the wood carving behind me. And so uh, this brochure had been printed and during the course of the week. Uh, I got some more printed uh, to have throughout this sermon series. So keep it handy with you and you can see in turn what each of these areas mean. The dark shaded areas that you see on the back side indicate which of the Beatitudes is being preached about on that particular day. Does that make sense to everyone? So just keep that uh, handy if uh, you will. I'd also remind you all that Vacation Bible School is coming up in a week, uh, not this week, but next week. For those of you who are teaching, I'm grateful. Um, for those of you who are sending children, I'm also grateful. Uh, you might spread the word, encourage folks to come uh, beginning next Monday for uh, Vacation uh, Bible School. Um, I'm grateful for the trustees uh, to, who've helped lead uh, and point our way toward redoing the sanctuary and some other areas of the building. Uh, you can see the whole area has been spruced up. There's still scaffolding in the back, which I think will be down this Sunday, next Sunday. Uh, still scaffolding in the back where they're still working on some things. Um, but uh, holes have been patched. Uh, bad pieces of plaster have been replastered. And the whole thing has been painted. I'm right, Shane, aren't I about all those things? Huh? We're getting there uh, throughout all that. So uh, thanks to the to trustees for helping uh, do that. Uh, and it's good to see you all. The invitation uh, to Holy Communion is found on page number 12 uh, in uh, your hymnals. Um, and I'm going to ask that you stand as we share together this invitation to communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Uh, it says here, that we're going to sing before we confess, but I'm going to switch that, and I'm, we're going to confess before we sing, if that's okay with everybody. Okay. So let's confess our sins together. It's, uh, uh, oh, she's got who can wash away my, oh, there we go, it's right. Okay. Let's pray together, shall we? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We've not loved our neighbors, and we've not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, and your response is the same. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now let's sing nothing but the blood of Jesus uh, as we worship together. Let's sing together. Oh, 
Amen. Won't you be seated? I'm going to invite you to join with me as we pray together. We'll pray silently, and then I will lead us to a pastoral prayer as we gather up all of our prayers together. Let's pray, shall we? Oh God, we give you thanks today because before you, our hearts can be open and we can realize that from you, no secrets can be hidden. And so, O oh Lord, we bring to you today shame and sorrow for our sinfulness, for too often we have forgotten that our life comes from you and lives unto you. Throughout this week, O oh God, we've neither sought nor done your will. There have been times when we've not been truthful in our hearts or in our speech or in our lives. And so today, O oh Lord, we ask, as you forgive us and heal us, to help us love as we ought to love, to raise us from our sin into the life that you set before us in the Sermon on the Mount, that we may Indeed, end today and every day in peace, that we may trust in your kindness and in your mercy and in your grace, even until the very end. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Now, friends, we're going to sing together, Holy, Holy, Holy. We've been studying in Sunday school the book of Revelation and we just got through looking this morning um, at three chapters that describe the visitation of beasts led by the devil himself. And in response to the devil leading those beasts to manipulate, control, and deceive us, in heaven what we do as the church is we sing. We gather to worship and we sing together. That's right. We sing to chase away the devil so today, when you sing, don't mumble, okay? The Lord will hear you, but the devil may not if you mumble, okay? So sing out loud. Even if you can't sing, sing out loud, okay? For this is a hymn that I promise you, you will know. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let's sing the devil out of our hearts today, shall we? Would you stand as we sing together? Holy, holy, holy. Let's sing.
Amen. Won't you be seated? As you all know, if you were here last Sunday, I'm going to spend these next a couple of Sundays, uh, last Sunday and today as well, preaching through the Sermon on the Mount and particularly the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, reading from Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter. If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me, we're going to read from Matthew 5. Uh, 1 to 12, I'm going to read this each and every Sunday over these next couple of weeks. And in the meantime, I keep talking, trying to find it in my Bible, okay? But I'll find it here and stop talking so I can find it uh, as we go. Matthew 5, 1 to 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. By the way, it's these two Beatitudes that I'm going to talk about today. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And the Lord add his blessing to this, the reading of his holy word. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord God, give us grace today as we proclaim your word so that these words might be transformed into the very word that saves us. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, you may find it strange that I'm going to begin today um, preaching not rescued from pride or blessed are those, uh, the very first beatitude, but instead I'm going to begin with the second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, and maybe this will make sense as we move through it. A number of years ago, I invited a professor from Texas A&M uh, named Virginia Stem Owens, who was a poet, uh, taught English uh, to uh, Aggies throughout the years, uh, or in her words, she tried to teach them English uh, uh, to a bunch of Texans who were going to A&M, uh, and she wrote beautifully, um, uh, a number of great books that included poetry in it, including In Praise of Old Men, which I read now with more uh, cherished delight than I once did. Okay. She wrote a book about her mother, and, but more importantly, and what it got my attention, is that Virginia Owens wrote a book called Looking for Jesus, and in it she attempted to describe looking for Jesus in the words of Scripture. After having read her book, I invited her to come and speak at a lecture series um, that was endowed at a church I was serving. Uh, I really didn't know her, but I was so impressed with her book. I called her one day, got hold of her number, asked her to come speak, and she agreed to come. Okay? Now, there's danger in asking people to come speak after you've read their books, and that danger was confirmed she was a great writer and a terrible speaker, but that's another story. A wonderful person, uh, but didn't, uh, couldn't tell stories very well. But over the course of time uh, in that lecture series at First Methodist Church Longview, what she did was is that she compared um, paintings of Jesus throughout the centuries. Okay? And that's a fascinating thing to do if you ever have time just to go back and look at how Jesus is portrayed visually over the years. Okay? And what she argued, and I think with some truth to this, is that she argued pictures of Jesus represented the angst and anxiety of the particular time that picture was painted. Okay? 
whatever is going on in the culture at the time. It's kind of fascinating. I then started paying some attention to what the photographs, not photographs, obviously, the pictures and paintings of Jesus represented to people who saw them. And I don't know if we got those on the screen or not. Okay? These are two that I wanted to show. Okay? If you look at the one on the right, okay, it says Jesus wept. Okay? And you see Jesus bent and broken. The only place that that occurs in Scripture is when Jesus approaches Jerusalem before his crucifixion, his arrest and crucifixion. As he approaches, what does he do? He weeps what? Over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And then he weeps. Okay? The other picture that you see there okay, is one you don't see very often. You see it of Jesus laughing. Okay? Now, when you compare those two things, what image of Jesus represents your heart and life? Do you think Jesus is one who throws back his head and laughs? Or do you think Jesus is one who bows his head and weeps. Okay? Now, what I'm going to say to you as we begin this sermon today is I think Jesus does both. If you look at the translation, remember what I said about the Beatitudes last week? They do three things. They're an the accurate description of who Jesus is. Okay? You, you, you got that? The Beatitudes tell us who Jesus is. The second thing it tells us is what the church, yes, even this church, ought to be accompanied by God's grace. This is what we ought to represent okay, as a people. And the third thing is, it's a description of our individual lives, what we're called to do as we live holy lives before the Lord. This describes it. If you ever want to know, what should I do as a Christian? What do you go read? Well, you can read lots of things, but I'd recommend you read the Beatitudes. Just read them. The other thing that we looked at was the curious word, makarios, the Greek word that gets translated as blessed. You might remember last week that what I said about that word is that it gets translated in interesting ways. One of the ways it gets translated is happy are. Okay? Actually, one translation reads in this way, oh, the joy. It has to do with ultimate joy and happiness. William Barclay translated, oh, the bliss. Now, we don't use that word very often in our daily conversation. But he said, oh, the bliss of those who do these things. Now, this is a curious thing to say about mourning, is it not? Oh, the joy, the happiness, the bliss of those who mourn. Now, how in heaven's name can Jesus say that? Or what does that mean? Let's talk about that for just a little bit this morning. Have y'all seen those pictures that come out periodically of Jesus on screens, you know, uh, like on uh, door screens? There's a picture, a face of Jesus that shows up. I swear on my front door, uh, the wood grain has a picture of Jesus in it. I, I, I swear to you, it's there, only because that's what I see when I look at it. Sometimes those things become almost instantaneous attractions, and people are drawn to them. They claim to see things like the tears on the face of a saint, a saint who weeps. And you'll see particularly Roman Catholics gather around and treat as icons those pictures of saints. Is it scientifically impossible? Well, of course it is. We don't think that really happens. But every reasonable mind knows that a screen can't weep uh, or a painting doesn't cry. But these reports, these likenesses of Jesus or Mary or a saint are common among us. When they occur, they're often dismissed as hysterical or hysteria or superstition or simply the condensation of moisture that happens on the face of a door as well. But the theological symbolism of tears on a holy face, oh, it's gone away. Tears on the holy face of Jesus weeping is right to a point, and I want to make it today. Weeping pictures are interpreted by those of us who believe in them as signs, a sign that God grieves over the state of the world. God grieves over the state even of my soul at times. 
piety might be misplaced in the veneration of wet paintings, weeping paintings, but an awareness as Christians that we are a people who mourn deeply about the brokenness of the world, that we are a people who lament with passion, that's quite remarkable, it seems to me, and is a call for you and me to mourn where we should. And I'll tell you, the second beatitude, blessed, happy, holy are those who mourn, is hardly a very popular sermon text. Okay? The only time you probably hear it preached is at funerals or on occasions like this as part of a series on the Beatitudes. Blessed, happy, holy are those who mourn. That's good for a funeral, but how is it good for me, and how is it good for you? I think it's good for a great deal more in our lives. When grief, when Christian grief, when God's grief is rightly understood by us, None of the Beatitudes can be interpreted apart from the ministry and person of who Jesus is. And his example for us makes sense. He's not only the Jesus who laughs with the crowd, but he's also the Jesus who mourns with grief over loss. We believe that Jesus was the Lord, was God in flesh. But he was a real human being, and he knew the joy of living. If you read Scripture closely, you'll discover that Jesus enjoyed humor and employed irony in what he taught and said. The church has often tried to rob him of being playful, but playful he is. There are riddles he uses in response to cagey questions from adversaries, and many of those responses are given partly in jest to those who ask strange questions. Jesus liked a good party. He liked the chatter of children. He observed carefully the fields of wild flowers. And at the same time, Jesus was keenly aware of the dark side of human life, of the evil of human history. He knew carefully, he knew well, the malevolence of individuals who were twisted by something, by the devil himself. And he knew the infecting and disrupting social organizations that rob people of their dignity and rob people of their lives. He even wept, as the picture showed earlier, over the city of Jerusalem. He wished that Jerusalem knew what it made for peace, and the tears that flowed from Jesus' cheeks were human and real. He was heartbroken. They were God's tears. That's right, God's tears a divine lament over the state of the world. I'd be curious to know how Jesus might respond to our time, except I think he'd respond in the same way. He would weep as well and perhaps even weep over Port Natchez and maybe even weep over our church as well. But in his weeping, he establishes something important. He establishes a certain quality for me and a certain quality for you of what it means to be holy, the mourners, not moaners, <laughs> but the mourners in the second beatitude are those whose grief is akin to the grief of Jesus. Now, it's interesting to me, the Greek word here for mourn is the highest level of intensity you can have of grief. It's the strongest impossible term. It implies an agony of the heart expressed in a flood of tears. It expresses a bewailing of the state of affairs. Holy mourning is a deep caring about what God loves and cares for in life. His heart breaks for us. I'll never forget when I first started doing funerals, odd things happen in funerals. I've got too many funeral stories to tell, but I'll tell one in particular. In my very first church in Edom, Texas, population 201, halfway between Tyler and Canton, Texas, on a farm to market road. I'll never forget when (coughs) Aladdin Babs, husband, died. Now, just two weeks before he died, okay, Mr. Babb had gone, he ran trot lines in Calendar Lake, a local lake, 
and he had caught a 90-pound catfish. There was commotion one day uh, outside my little window. The preacher's office wasn't air-conditioned, so you had to have the window open uh, during this time. And there was commotion, and I think all 201 people in Edom, Texas, were outside on the main street, which was the farm to market road, watching a truck come down the road. Well, being the curious young man that I was, I went out too and pulled behind Mr. Babb's truck was this 90-pound catfish. He couldn't get it in his truck. He was too old and weak to get it in the truck bed, so he hitched it to the trailer hitch, and he dragged it through town, okay? Now, there was not much left of that catfish when he got that thing dragged through town, okay? But he did, and he strung it up in a tree like you'd string up a hog to do butchering of a hog. He strung it up in a tree, and he cut off great globs of fat, and he fried them for anybody who wanted to eat them. Now, I want to tell you something, friends. If you ever get a chance to eat a 90-pound catfish, don't, okay? Does that mean get a, get a smaller catfish? They taste better than those great big fat ones, but nonetheless... That's what he did. Two weeks later, he was dead. Mr. Ernest Babb was dead, one of the key leaders in the church. And we had his funeral. The funeral home at the time okay, did something that I hope no funeral home here ever does. They left a poor young preacher all, along with the, all alone with the widow in the church. Okay. All funerals in East Texas are done with open caskets. And so Mr. Ernest was lying in his casket. And Miss Aladine, after the rest of the family came through, was coming through herself to view her husband for the last time. And when she viewed him, she was so overcome by grief that she crawled into the casket with him, and with me there. And she said, I want to go home with you. I've never seen an outpouring of grief that was quite as intense as that. Okay? Now, it's also a recommendation I would never make to you all. Okay? Don't be alone at the end of a funeral with somebody who crawls in the casket. It's not a good thing. Okay? You have to get them out of the casket uh, uh, at some, somehow. And so we did that. But the intensity of grief, some of you, even sitting here today, understand that how intense that is okay? and the kind of grief that comes in life. I preached a, a, um, a revival one time in Elysian Fields, Texas, Anybody know where Elysian Fields is? Nobody, oh, Hubert knows where Elysian Fields is. Of course, Hubert's old enough to know everything about Texas, but that's a, <laughs> another story. Okay? He knows where it is. Elysian Fields every year did what they called a Brush Arbor Revival. If you've never been to Elysian Fields, have you ever been to a Brush Arbor Revival? Okay? Some of you may have. Brush Arbor Revivals were named as such because they would cut an arbor, a protected place, out of brush that was kind of surrounded and protected, and you did the revival outside. Brush Arbor Revivals in Elysian Fields were so commonplace, they had done it for so long, they did it under an arched tent, uh, an arched tent that where you preached. They provided each and every revival what was called a mourner's bench. M-O-U-R-N-E-R -E bench. And that bench was reserved for those people who were so convicted by the preaching that they were overcome by their own sinfulness and went to that mourner's bench to decry their own sin and to pray for forgiveness, expecting the preacher, that's me, to come down and pray with them as they mourned and lamented their sin. During the course of that Brush Arbor Revival, the course of that week, there are people who poured out their hearts and their lives. Some of you may have had this experience yourself where you're so overcome by your own shortcomings that you weep and have to pour them out. Okay? It happened here. When the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn, it is a statement about the intensity of grief over what we do with our own lives. Christians who exemplify the second beatitude are people who grieve greatly. They are mourners, not moaners, but mourners. They are righteously upset over their own sin or the evil they see around them. We who moan are simply complainers. Those who mourn are those whose hearts are broken around them. 
And that's expressed often in those mourners benching. This is about grief over our own sin. But for Jesus, it also covers a heartbrokenness over the sin of the world, over what happens in our society when things go terribly amiss. Often we who weep over the world are called to act on behalf of those who are in our midst. Years ago, I read a, I read a, a, a commentary in a, in a newspaper. I think it was an old New York Times. It's probably 40 years ago now. Okay. And the title of that editorial was called The Ick in the Armchair. Okay. Now, it stands out in my mind even now. It was written by a man who had um, read a book by Colin Turnbull called The Mountain People. He was an anthropologist who wrote this book, The Mountain People, about the ick, I-K, okay, who had a terrible habit, okay, not habit, but they had a terrible custom in their culture of taking advantage of one another. Okay. There was not much caring within that culture itself because it was legitimate even in families to take advantage of one another. Most of our families are not like that, or some of your families may be. You may have a few icks floating around in your life. But this was called the ick in the armchair. He was reading this review, he was reading about these mountain people, and something came on the television screen with his mother sitting beside him of some disaster, some tragedy that happened. It was a, a bus wreck that killed children, or it was something like that. And he turned to his mother, and he said to his mother, why are you crying okay, about this? He, she looked at him and said, doesn't your heart break for the parents, for the mamas and daddies of these children who are dying? And that's when he said he realized he had become what? The ick in the armchair. Christians are those who sit in our armchairs and watch the evening news and weep and weep over the state of the world. Now that description of blessed are those who mourn leads me to the very first beatitude. Okay? Alice in Wonderland um, says these words. The caterpillar asks Alice a question. Are you content now? Y'all have ever read Alice in Wonderland? You remember the caterpillar asking that question? Are you content now? And Alice, this is after she's been shrunk to three inches. Okay? She says, well, I'd like to be a little larger than I am now. Three inches is such a wretched height to be, Alice says. I'm not used to it. When we're proud, the human boast is always a little larger. We are not content with what we have. Still more, and larger and larger until Alice in another phase, and Alice in the Wonderland found so large she fills the whole space. Small is a wretched size for pride, for our pride is not used to small. It fills the whole space. Pride, like bigness, okay, because, in the words of Dorothy Sayers, it intends to creep under the ribs of God. We want to grow to be like God himself, pushing God out of our universe. Those of us who fail to mourn over the brokenness of the world very often replace holy mourning with an outsized pride that pushes God away. Pride's the first deadly sin, and the first beatitude that we read that today is appropriately anti-pride. We as Christians are called to be what? Poor in spirit is what the beatitude says. If you're poor in spirit, you'd simply refuse to take part in the deification and making gods out of human beings. We resist too often the call and promise of Jesus in our lives and instead place our hope on the pride that is filled with a desire for possessions and pleasures and for hopes and for sciences in our lives, whatever it is that replaces it. Our boast is only in whom? Y'all help me here. Our boast is in, I've told the class earlier, when you don't know what the answer is, you always say what? Jesus, okay? Our boast is always in Jesus. Spirit in the Beatitudes means an animating life force that is within us, a consciousness of ourselves in the world at large. 
To be poor in spirit doesn't necessarily mean that we adopt a certain pattern of behavior so much as it means that I am called to live in Christ. I am called to live in Christ Jesus. That I'm to be attached to the call of Christ in my life and the promise of Christ so that I can be detached from worldly things that too often give humanity their definition of what it means to be human and freed from all claims to human self-sufficiency. How often do we do that? I'm going to close today with this. The poor in spirit, those of us who are poor in spirit, claim with the psalmist these words. Listen to the words of the psalm. This is the 34th. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Did you hear that? My soul makes our boast in the Lord. Y'all repeat it with me. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Holy are those who mourn. Happy are those whose hearts break for the hurt and anguish that we cause others and that the world causes others. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who finally boast not in themselves, but instead boast only in God. Friends, as we come to the communion table this morning, trusting in God for our salvation, trusting in the Lord that the blood of the Lamb shed on the cross covers over our sinfulness and allows us to make the claim that is made for us in the Beatitude. Happy and holy are those who are poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. You may not shed tears as you come to the altar today, but may you in your heart celebrate with true joy, with true joy, that the Lord's heart breaks with us even when our hearts are lost in pride. Okay? Set aside your pride. Receive God's forgiveness as we come today. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, help us to trust in you, our Lord and our Savior today. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to affirm our faith with the words to the Apostles' Creed. I'm going to ask that you stand as we make this affirmation of faith. Okay? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Won't you be seated? And I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward to receive our morning offering. And as they come, I'm going to offer this prayer for our offering. Oh Lord, receive these gifts that we offer to you and bless them to your service. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, guys. I'm done. Y'all can go. Okay. Jesus, what a
lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to give our thanks. thanks. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever, and may we all say, Amen. And with the confidence of God's children, pray our Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, before I ask Nikki to come forward, um, who's going to help me serve today, it's been a long time since we've served communion in this way. We've used the little cups now for, what, a year and a half, a, a long time. And these little, the little cups, which you pull open, are open to you if you choose to use them. But what we'll also do is I'll come by with bread, okay? I'll put bread in your hands. You eat it. Then you take a cup that Nikki will serve in the tray and drink it. As you come, you can fill the altar space that is before you, and we will serve you. Here, we will not do table dismissals by that we won't call you up by table, dismiss you, and call up another table. As you see a spot open, I'm just going to invite you to come as you will. Does that make sense to everybody? If you'll come by the center aisle, you can return by the side aisles back to your seats, or you can swim upstream and go back up the, the center aisle uh, as well. It's okay with me uh, to do that. I'm going to ask Nikki to come as we celebrate together our Lord's Supper.
behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I rise. Amen. Amen.